My name is Laurent Chandrapala. I'm from Armchair Criminal. I welcome you all to this part of the program. This is the part two of four, ser four part series of Unavailable Witnesses. This part of the program is the first development of what we looked at in part one, where we analyzed the section 116 in particular and now we are going to look into it in further detail here we will be considering in particular not only the unavailable witness issue but where the witness is anonymous i.e. the identity of the person is not known or where the identity of the person is known, anonymity is given to the witness. That is what I propose to deal with this part of the program. And I hope that you will find it equally useful. The first question that I'm going to pose is what is the difference between a witness who is seeking anonymity and an anonymous statement maker. For that, you may want to consider section 116. The short answer is before we look, to, look into section 116 is to understand the difference between the two. Anonymous witness, the court is unaware who that person is. If the court is unaware, the opposing party would be unaware, in which case they will not be able to challenge that witness. The, the, the evidence is relied on this anonymous witness by the Crown. The defendant would undoubtedly would feel that he is not in a position to challenge that person because we don't know who that person is. In which case it is not surprising that the defendant would feel that his right to a fair trial is denied. We cannot have a system where the anonymous witness gives evidence not in a way to challenge that person and find in the defendant guilty. That would be to go against the grain of our jurisprudence. Equally, it will be foolhardy for the criminal justice system to operate where there are legitimate reasons for withholding the identity of the witness. And even if the defendant knows the identity of the person, it will not make hoot of a difference to the case. For example, if it is an undercover police officer who is doing a test purchase of drugs, does it matter when everything is recorded that the identity of the police officer is put into the public domain? How would undercover officers then operate? It will not happen. So it is to protect that we have a mechanism to give evidence with the permission of the court by declaring a witness anonymous. In other words, giving anonymity. 
I said that you may want to consider section 116. I have highlighted the relevant parts in red brackets and you may find that useful. Remember that the witness who is seeking anonymity is available to be challenged. So section 116 subsection 1 reads as follows. In criminal proceedings, a statement not made in oral evidence in the proceedings is admissible as evidence of any matter stated if A goes on to describe or a matter. The important part now comes in paragraph B. The person who made the statement, the relevant person, is identified to the court's satisfaction and then goes on. So there, there you have the authority where it comes from. It is section 160 demands that the identity of the person is known to the court, not only known to the court, to the satisfaction of the court. What is meant by this statement the relevant person is identified in Criminal Justice Act, Section 116, Subsection 1. It, what it means is the statement maker. In other words, the identity of the maker of the statement is the relevant person. We looked at earlier the philosophy behind it. That is why I have asked myself the question, why is it important to have the identity of the witness? As I described earlier, it is to give the defendant or the opposing party an opportunity to cross-examine. That is to preserve Article 63D, right to a fair trial. There are cases which are very interesting to look at. The case of Vinzic and Austria. This is a case where the court said, yes, at the th stage of investigation, the police can rely on information you get from anonymous witnesses but when it comes to court it's a different story in a democratic society there is fair play open justice right to challenge they all come into play and for example you take a serious incident taking place police comes there they speak to various people where did he run where did he go did you see people give information they take those leads and make their inquiries but when it comes to court they need to nail their colors to the mast they need the witness to come to court and say the suspect ran in that direction and the police will say that we ran because of the information we had it was given by Mr. X Y and Z so you need that that is the philosophy behind the next we consider why is it necessary to seek the identity of the person and where they come from? Why we need to need the identity of the person to cross-examine? What is the purpose of cross-examination? Either it is to undermine the witness's evidence and to test credibility. Subsection 1. This section applies if in criminal proceedings, A, 
the statement not made in oral evidence in the proceedings is admitted as evidence of a matter stated and b the maker of the statement does not give oral evidence in connection with the subject matter therefore you have the situation of the reason why is it necessary it clearly makes the point this section applies where the maker of the statement does not give oral evidence in connection with the matter stated then subsection 2 goes on to describe in such a case a any evidence which if he had given such evidence would have been admissible as relevant to his credibility as a witness is so admissible in the proceedings you have the word credibility that's what it is all about there b evidence may with the court's leave be given of any matter which if he had given such evidence could have been put to him in cross-examination as relevant to his credibility so there the evidence could be adduced what could have been put to him in cross-examination as a witness but of which evidence could not have been adduced by the cross-examining party then in C it says evidence tending to prove that he made at whatever time any other statement inconsistent with the statement admitted as evidence is admissible for the purpose of showing that he contradicted himself you would note that the rationale of identifying the witness the relevant person is to give the opportunity to those who wish to challenge the credibility that's what the section referred to throughout looking at the credibility section 124 is quite clear on that in other words adducing evidence giving the other side the opportunity looking at, at subsection 3 if as a result of evidence admitted under this section an allegation is made against the maker of a statement the court may permit a party to lead additional evidence of such description as the court may specify for the purposes of denying or answering the allegation this again goes back to the point of where you look at the credibility next what we will look at is what is the rationale it is to do with, with the relevant person how the courts have applied this principle is established in some cases one of which we just looked at Winsage and Austria then you have a case by the name of Maya and others Koenga and Ford Myers is a case that had multiple appeals being heard at the Court of Appeal. In fact, there were four unconnected cases. I have the authority here. And the court looked at, at the beginning, the basic principles of anonymity being given to witnesses 
and then adduced, after which the court went on to consider each appeal separately. Mars is a case that was a murder case and the court considered in general terms various suspects the human rights of the defendant as well as that of the witnesses how they could be looked after like having to give safe houses moving away from the area how will that impact on the human their human rights and the public interest criteria thereafter the court also considered the procedural aspects that could be implemented to overcome the problems going to the case of Myers in a short while in fact it is interesting to note on paragraph 20 of this judgment the court said the first consideration in effect restates a common law principle that the defendant is normally entitled to know the identity of any witness who gives incriminating evidence against him and incorporates it within the statutory framework this is his general right and its proclamation also acknowledges the potential disadvantage to the defendant if he is ignorant of the witness's identity and reinforces the principle of open justice this is what i precisely talked about earlier the importance of the defendant being given the details of the witness it is to do with open justice and his rights but his rights are not the only rights the witnesses are also have human rights too you cannot disrupt the witnesses human rights by asking you how to adapt a new identity move out of the area that will be ridiculous and not only that if you were to ask the person to move away from the community you might actually expose the person even more by isolating him or uh, for that matter the case of myers john myers this was a trial that took place at kingston crown court for allegations of murder and in this case there were witnesses and the trial was basically ready few weeks before the trial started suddenly a new person came under a pseudonym with the name of Janet Evans that name was used as part of the anonymity and there were the other witnesses who gave evidence a person by the name of Chambers gave evidence then followed by Taylor but they withdrew their evidence in essence during the trial so what they so they were declared and they were declared hostile and basically regarded as unreliable only evidence the prosecution could rely on as the identity was that was the evidence of Janet Evans however there were other evidence which could be used like telephone evidence and in fact some injury on the defendant which the prosecution said was consistent needless to say the defendant denied and tried to give an exam uh, give how give reasons as to how he came about them and judging his summing up basically said chambers and taylor well members of jury basically you can use them if you wish but they are pretty unreliable and in paragraph 52 the, the court of appeal said this our decision must be based on the terms of the act and can be expressed very briefly here meaning the 
the actor where anonymity evidence was able to be adduced through Criminal Evidence Act Witnesses Anonymity Act 2008. So this is what the court said. Our decision must be based on the terms of the act and can be expressed very briefly but unequivocally. This conviction is unsafe. Notwithstanding the absence of full and comprehensive inquiries needed to set against the disadvantages created for the appellant by the anonymity order. Her evidence, this is Janet's evidence, assumed decisive importance in the case against the appellant. Without it, conviction would have been highly improbable. We do not have sufficient confidence that everything relating to her credibility, motivation, integrity was revealed. In the result, in our judgment, the trial process was unfair. There you are. Here is a witness who has given evidence under a pseudonym because anonymity was given, the witness was in court, but the defense was not satisfied and they appealed. She had convictions, she came late to the scene and there was question marks. So therefore, the defense was difficult in difficulty. The other court said that is not acceptable. Another case that I would like to consider out of the four cases that is listed here is a case called Bahman Dash and Costello. This is a case where Bahman Dash and Costello were running a nightclub. Bahman Dash was the owner and Costello was the manager. There, the police had reservations as to the integrity of the management. In that, they suspected drug dealing taking place. They came to talk to the management. They said, we have a zero policy. As a result of that, the police deployed several undercover officers to the nightclub where they were freely able to buy drugs. And they alleged that the owner and the manager, at least they were turning a blind eye to this. What they said is in fact, I have been offered drugs. I have rebuffed and got rid of because we do not tolerate drug dealing in our club. The officers who came to give evidence, they were all given anonymity. The defendants were convicted. They appealed. When it came to the Court of Appeal, it was established that there was enough evidence at least to establish a prima facie case and the defence would not have been able to make a half-time submission. It is correct that evidence were given by undercover officers. What the court did notice that the undercover officers were extensively tested in cross-examination. And one of the things that the defense said The owner was offered drugs and he said, I didn't want drugs. I basically got rid of them. The people who, they said that we could not ask the police officers who gave evidence 
do you recognize my client? Did he not refuse to buy drug? Did he tolerate any form of drug dealing in? The Court of Appeal said there was nothing wrong with the officers giving evidence with anonymity. It is not the question, the police officers knowing the defendant's identity. It was the defendants knowing the officer's identity what mattered. Therefore, the defense could have easily have shown a photograph to the relevant officer by description of the officer whom they would say offered to sell. Ask, did my client ever offered drugs or was he ever offered and he refused? No problem. So here, that's a classic example. A police officer doing his job has no axe to grind. Giving straightforward evidence and his identity needs to be protected for future operations and for his safety. That evidence was regarded as perfectly fine. What the Court of Appeal did say is this. The evidence of the anonymous witness was extreme, extensively tested, but their individual credibility was not challenged in cross-examination. In essence, it was accepted that they were undercover officers performing a professional duty who were entirely unconnected with the appellants, the club, or indeed Plymouth. The accuracy of their evidence could be, could be tested. There was no reason to believe that any of them had a tendency or a motive to be dishonest. It is correct that they gave very graphic evidence. That's, that's the nature of the game. So there you have the situation where anonymity can be justifiably allowed and the evidence can be given. There is quite a lot in that way that evidence can be admitted. I would like to very briefly touch upon a case by the name of VP and R. This is basically a, a gang fight. And it was quite serious. Here, the witnesses were terrified in giving evidence because of the repercussions that could follow from giving evidence in court if it is if it becomes known to the defendant that evidence was given against them i think you would recall in my first part of the program i mentioned that a witness a witness who's put in fear and doesn't come to court to give evidence the person who made the threat cannot profit from that. I will be looking at the fear concept in the fourth part of this program. But for the time being, let me just refer to the relevant part, which was paragraph 113. The judge went on to say, the Court of Appeal went on to say, in our judgment, notwithstanding the ingenuity of Mr. Langdon's argument, taken to its logical conclusion, we being invited to rewrite 2000 Act by extending anonymous witness orders to permit anonymous hearsay evidence to the jury. We cannot do that. Here, the prosecution lost the in, uh, interrogatory application interrogatory application to have anonymity order. 
when the trial judge refused. So they were not allowed to do that. In the case of Kenyan, which is the next one, this was a case where a family had gone on holiday to the Europe and on their way back an illegal ent entrant to the UK was found and the court was asked to allow material to be produced for the defense from an anonymous witness. In fact, the material was a fact statement and if that is correct in what is said in the uh, facts, then it would have supported the defense case. He said that the police have failed to investigate the matter properly when they had a duty to investigate matters not only implicated him but also exonerated, which is correct. But it has to be reasonable. Here the court said, hold on. This is ridiculous, basically. You know your friend. What was the problem? You getting the person to come and give evidence. This is what it was said. In paragraph, I'm going to refer to paragraph 14 and 15 and part of 18. Paragraph 14 says, this case was, of course, heard prior to the operation of Criminal Justice Act 2003. However, Parliament was acutely conscious of Blasland type consideration and section 118 governs the admissibility of evidence when a witness is unavailable. Statement not made in oral evidence will be admissible provided one overall evidence given in the proceedings by a person who made the statement would be admissible as evidence of the matter stated, which we know that is in the legislature. The identity of the maker, in other words, the identity of the, of the maker of the statement, the relevant person is established. Paragraph 15, any regime controlling admissibility of evidence must be alert to the dangers of fabrication. The Crown's case was this Mr. Gyanga doesn't exist. And when the defendant's wife gave evidence, she basically contradicted Mr. K Mr. Kyanga. Uh, sorry, uh, Kenya. So the court has to be alert to the possibility of fabricating evidence. Therefore, the court took the view it was correct that the recorder properly excluded that evidence. And in paragraph 18, it went on to say, if indeed he did exist, that Mr. Yanga, and was a family friend of the appellant, then the appellant was in the best possible position to secure his attendance at court or alternately satisfy the preconditions set out in section 23 to be of the Criminal Justice Act 1988. Now, of course, we are referring to section 116. That is the situation. Finally, we have the case of Ford. Ford is a case where there were several allegations against the defendant and he was remanded in custody following basically a shooting. Whilst he was in custody, another shooting took place. Witnesses came, gave, gave details. And one of the things that did take place, an unknown witness, soon after the incident, came to the police and said, gave a piece of paper with the car registration number and said, this is the registration number of the person who shot and ran, or drove off rather, and I don't want to get involved. 
that was the long and the short of her involvement. The subject of the appeal rested on was the evidence of this anonymous witness who gave the piece of paper with the car registration number. Should that have been admitted in evidence? And the Court of Appeal said no. All the other grounds of the appeal were dismissed, but the Court of Appeal allowed the appeal purely on the basis of the fact that anonymous witnesses' evidence, i.e. the car registration number, was allowed to be adduced. That is the situation. It goes to show how important it is to establish the identity of the witness. Not only that, if there is going to be anonymity, witness order, the proper grounds are laid. And evidence is provided to the satisfaction of the court that the identity of the person is available and there are grounds, proper grounds, for making the anonymity witness or the application. That is generally is given as the last resort in a trial because there are other safeguards that could be put in place like screens, remote links, voice being uh, basically changed. That's the situation. I'm now I'm going to conclude this part of the program and we will move on to the third part of the program very swiftly. I hope you will join me. That I think will be a fairly long process because there are quite a lot to cover in that before we move on to the the fourth and final part of this series unavailable witnesses through fear thank you for your time i hope this was informative and you enjoyed it see you soon take care and god bless you.